So a lot of people think that, oh, I would like to be a realtor. I would like to work in real estate or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And so today I wanted to talk about like, how do you become a realtor and what are the things that you need to know? And because some of these people that are interested in being a realtor never talked to one before or don't really know like day to day. They just see Selling Sunset or buying Beverly Hills on Netflix. And um, <laughs> I, so I thought today we could give some kind of insight to here's what it takes, here's where you need to go, and here's the kind of behind the scenes stuff you need to know where it's not just I'm going to go show houses and look cute and right. get checks at closing. That's not all the glean that you see out there. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Obviously, the realtor industry has a lot of people who've worked in other industries who then come into this as like a second career or another option. Um, but we are finally seeing a shift in the age demographics of people who are coming into the business as well, which means people are coming in at a younger age and really having a difference of perspective on technology and tools, marketing skills and things like that, which are all beneficial things. So if you think you can be a realtor or you think you want to be a realtor, I guess I would ask why. If you say it's because I love real estate, I always love all the decorating, I love it. There are so many things that are involved with being a realtor that maybe licensed realtor isn't specific to what you want to do. Maybe you just want to do one of the aspects of being a realtor. Like property management. Like, well, the property management, you have to be licensed in order to do that, but you could be working in staging. You could oh, work okay. in um, just doing the marketing for a real estate office. So that's where I start with somebody is what is it about being a realtor you think you're interested in? So we want to hone down and find out if you really are interested in being a realtor. I want to be the person who helps people to buy and sell houses. Then you want to be a realtor. That's yeah. a licensed practitioner of the uh, real estate industry. So the first step is to have the licensing requirements. So you're taking the classes. They're available online or in school in person. You can do that through Sinclair Community College. You can also do that through Hondros here in our area. Um, and that is giving you that book learning of what it takes to be a realtor. It gives you the financial aspects that come into play because you need to be able to talk about the lending requirements and what's the loan made up and how do you determine if somebody can qualify for this even though they're going to talk with a lender you still need to understand and be able to talk that language to somebody so that you know that they can actually buy the process the property that they're interested in yeah um the other aspect of that is that you learn the license law so what are we allowed to do what words are we allowed to say versus those things that are protected. So obviously you have fair housing rules and requirements and you have to follow that. There's advertising so rules. So you can't say like, we'll only sell to families. Right. <laughs> we'll only sell to single white female. Correct. And, you know, there's some that have even talked. We have one of our um, <clears throat> communities who's legal zoning actually doesn't allow them to talk about 55 plus communities. I always thought like with fair housing, how can they do that? So it actually is opposite of what they have on their zoning, but the community has it zoned within their own regulations. So they've, they are superseding this, but you is can't that like the villages. Or you something? can't discriminate against a protected class. And so I couldn't say, just in general, that I won't sell to you because you are older or younger than what I think I need to sell to. But if you have a community that's designated as a senior living complex, that is already taken care of and not a, a violation of fair housing. So those are designated and allowed okay. to be there. Um, the issue that had been is because you have one person in the home who's maybe 55 plus, but then they have a younger person that's in the home. And so there's always this conflict within the community that we don't want younger people here. And this is supposed to be, so it gets into be a whole nother thing. But I digress. Fair housing <laughs> sounds like a good uh, podcast topic. 
Yes, that will be, we could bring in a specialist to talk about that um, because we have Miami Valley Fair Housing Association here in our area. And it is, it's a requirement of our license law as realtors to have every year. And it is the biggest thing that people violate and can get into serious trouble over. Like it, those fines are very serious. They're so six what figure. Are, what are some of the things you've seen? Um, a lot of times it's having to do with a disability, um, not having access for ADA compliance within a multifamily type of situation. That can be a violation. Um, it's not necessarily that the realtor has violated this, but if language is used or the, the seller has things that are a situation. Um, the other thing, in, and it, a lot comes into play with property management, that's the other area that gets targeted a lot with issues um, is with service companion animals. Oh, and yeah. there's requirements that come into there. So if you're going to become a realtor, these are all things you have to learn and be willing to understand and follow the rules on um, and also to inform your clients, both buyers and sellers, that this is the way this has to be, you know. So does it get taught in that class yes. at one of those? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I know some other – classes that I've taken have taught to pass the exam to get it not really and then you learn the majority of the um, rules regulations day to day you know once you're employed with a company yes and and that's true you're, a lot of what you're going to be pushed to learn is going to be specific to the test but in the general classes those courses that they have they're going to focus on what are the requirements, right? Ohio license law dictates these things. And just like uh, we were talking about different potential positions, there are certain rules as an unlicensed assistant, what you can and cannot do. If you violate that, you're, even though you're not licensed, that realtor who's brought you in, sponsoring you, is the one that could be into serious trouble then. As an unlicensed oh. assistant, you cannot talk about purchase price, terms of the deal, or anything like that. You can't do any of that. You can mm -hmm. do ancillary paperwork on the back end stuff, but you can't be the focal point of the conversation with a client about these types of terms and things. Okay. So you get through school, mm -hmm. and then what? You got to take the test. So you've okay. learned it all. You think you've learned it all. And um, you've got to do the course cram test that allows for you to prep and check yourself before you pay out the money to go to the license center and have the test. Um, they tell you to plan about three hours for the license. Um, it probably isn't going to take you that long, but it's probably going to take you a couple hours. Um, and you either feel 100% confident or you feel like, oh, my God, I didn't learn anything that I needed to know. <laughs> Um, and so there's two parts to the test. There's an Ohio state version, and then there's national version. And people always seem to get caught up on one or the other. So some people find it really easy to get through all the state questions and no problem, no problem. And then they get to the, this national set, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I don't know any of this, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and the key is, is that, again, it's specific to the test, and so you will ask, be asked these questions as to what's about the title, how does this work, and do you understand the parts of a deed, and all of these things that, you know what, you probably never really have to deal with that because you're going to have a title company. Right. They're going to take <laughs> care of all those questions and answers, and you just, you need to know what you do with you writing out the contract, right? But... You will need to know this information if you have a client who's recently had a family member who's passed and now they're dealing with title issues and now there's a question. And so you want to be able to give them guidance. So that's why in the general scope, yes, you need to have this information. But if you start boiling it down, you're, you're going to know people that are going to be able to answer better for you. Okay. So do you have to do any kind of like internship or anything with hours with the, before you take the test? You don't, and I think that would be amazing opportunity for us to add. You know, we've had these real estate things come out, some things that I think we could have done differently. This is one of those aspects. I absolutely think an internship is a great opportunity, first of all, for people to get familiar with it in a protected way and see is it really a good fit for them. 
Um, but if you've spent the money for the courses and now you're getting ready to take the test, um, you also have to be sponsored by a broker. So as an okay. individual agent, you have to be housed under a brokerage. And this is before you take the test? Before you take the test. Okay. So it may not be the actual broker that you end up going with. So people will go to, like, the, the um, colleges will have career days and things like that, and then go around and talk to different people. They may say, okay, well, I'll go with this ABC Realty. And they go in, they have a conversation, they get whatever they need, and they go take the test. But then they come back and they're like, oh, that's probably not a good fit. Maybe I want to talk to this agent or this brokerage now. And they could change that. But the point that they are licensed, they will be under a brokerage itself. Okay. So it's kind of like, um, I guess, do cosmetologists have to work under somebody? I just asked my hairdresser this, and I think she told me that she could be independent on her own. Yeah. But the benefit of them being under a, a, a shop is what financially works for her. Yeah, so it's more like um, insurance agents. They need to be under some kind of company. Yeah. Even if you're on your own. Yeah. Because uh, this is like a 1099 job, right? Correct. Independent contractors. And um, so, for example, like you're an Allstate agent. You, even though you own your own Allstate, you still work for Allstate. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so that product. And, and that is um, the other big thing is you think you can be a realtor, the financial side of it. First of all, the cost of coming into our industry when compared to opening up a franchise or doing something maybe in a different industry, maybe we're a lower cost aspect, mm -hmm. but you're still going to pay for your college and your schooling, right? Which is anywhere from what? 500 to 1500, depending on where somebody is doing it. Okay. Um, and then you're paying for your license testing. So that's probably another couple of hundred dollars. But once you get licensed, you have your local state and national dues and they all get paid. Which is how much? Um, about? Yeah. So you're probably talking about another 1500 We've got some increases that are going to be taking place. So that number is going to go up. I'm going to round up and say it's 1500 to get started. Um, 1500 to 2000 is probably a better range for people to understand. So you're already probably into this by about 4500 or $5,000. In order to get your first paycheck, because you're independent contractor, you don't get paid hourly. You don't get paid on a weekly basis. Yeah. Your brokerage isn't going to be giving you a check because you show up to the office and... Look cute. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, it's not going to happen. So you, more importantly, have to be able to have financial stability during that time of what is it going to take for me to get a listing, get it under contract, and get it sold. So best case scenario, you know lots of people and you've got three friends who are getting ready to sell their house and so the first one pulls the trigger and you go list their house right away. You just got licensed and you're gonna go list their house. Well, even if you go under contract that week, you probably are gonna have 30 to 45 days before that's gonna close. Mm -hmm. So at the very earliest payday time we're talking is 30 to 45 days. Yeah. If this is your only source of income and you are like scrapping, trying to figure out how am I making it, what am I going to do, how am I paying my bills, um, you're going to be stressed during that time because it isn't going to happen fast. Right. And not to discourage people, but it's a reality check. And a lot of the agents that I work, that I've talked with, that I've trained over a period of years, you know, the biggest thing is, is treat this like a business because it is truly an opportunity for you to be a small business owner within a business, right? Mm -hmm. And those benefits that you are going to get are because you're doing bookkeeping, because you understand what it takes to get a listing and advertising that you have to pay for before you even get paid. Afterwards, do you do client appreciation? You know, what is, what is the whole circle of costs that are factored into this? And People's <coughs> eyes start rolling back, and they're like, I had no idea. I've done uh, training with agents who've been in the business for over 40 years. They have no idea. They don't know what it costs for their, cost, for their business to list a property, what their actual earnings were. I just have all these charges that go to my credit card, and I pay the bills when I get money, and I'm not worried. 
everybody wants to sell a realtor something. If you've got a photography business, if you do drones, if you have postcards that you'll mail out for people, we get hit up every day on an average three to five times, guaranteed. Yeah. And agents are notorious about signing up for everything because they think it's going to get them the next deal. But then they're really bad about following through on those programs. So I may spend $39 a month for that program, but I never go back in there and do anything with it. So I'm just wasting the money. But it's going to my credit card. I don't pay any attention to it. Mm-hmm. Well, after a period of time, if, you don't, if you've never done a profit and loss for your business, then you haven't treated your work as a business. It's a hobby. Yeah. So if you've pulled a profit and loss and you look at this, well, why do I have $2,400 a year going out for advertising? What am I advertising? You should know that number. Yeah. Right? You should know that every house that I list, I'm spending $600 on before I even get through a contract. So does it cost to list a house in the MLS? So your MLS itself costs you money. So you have your monthly, so we talked about those initial fees for state, local, and national. Mm -hmm. Then you have your monthly fees for your local association. That's your MLS access. So it's going to cost you money for that. If you have a lockbox, you've got additional charges. If you um, use platforms like electronic signature platforms or anything like that, those are all extra costs that may be added in there you start realizing every month you have money that's going out, but not necessarily money that's coming in. Yeah. You need to be hustling and you need to be prospecting and you need to be treating this like a business, meaning I may not have to be in at my desk nine to five, but if I never come to my desk, am I doing anything to generate business? Yeah. And these I think are really important things for somebody who's thinking about becoming a realtor to realize it is not like selling Sunset. Right. And it's not where you get this great gift of somebody just pops a million dollar listing down on your lap and you go run off and you got it under contract the first day. When that happens, that is a huge win. You're going to be walking on clouds and feeling invincible. Um, But rarely is that the issue, especially where we live in the Midwest. Okay. So I want to go back to you just got licensed and you're picking a broker. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that a new licensed realtor needs to know going into that process? So I would say that's very similar to what a client is going to do when they interview agents for listing, right? Or a buyer interviews you to be their buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. Um, You as the agent, are asking brokers, well, what are you doing for me? What's the benefit that I get out of it? Is it because of the name of the brokerage? Do I get leads from here? Does the leads cost me money? What do I, what are my office expenses? Do I have additional cost on top of my MLS? And more importantly, what's the mentoring or the training aspect that comes from it? Do I have any benefit of I'm new Somebody's showing me the ropes and helping to train me to make sure I understand all of the different things that are going to come about. Um, and more importantly, just like a client wants to know they can get a hold of you as the realtor, I know agents want to know that they can get a hold of their broker if something happens, that the broker is going to respond to them. And I've been in those agents' in those um, agents' shoes. I've been in those brokerages where the broker didn't even know who I was, and I'm standing behind them at some event. Um, you feel very minimal, not recognized or even appreciated. Um, and it's not how you want to feel. So from a small boutique brokerage to a mid size to a large size brokerage, personalities come into play. Interactions within those offices come into play. It's all a thing that will help either make your realtor decision a good decision for you and a career moving forward or people come out of this business very quickly Mm -hmm. and if they don't make it their first year they're out very quickly if they make it to three years then hey they probably hit over the bubble and they're going to be able to stay in it but it's harder I think it's harder now for people to stay in this business long term because of just the change in the actual economics of things of what's going on 
now with the changes in the industry, somebody who's been in the business, a lot of those are coming out of the business. Somebody who's never been in it, as long as they didn't learn those bad habits coming in, then they should be good and solid. Yeah. Like you don't even know that was the way. So yeah. don't look back, look forward and build your business this way. But make sure you have that person who's going to support you, the brokerage who's going to be there for you to make sure that that's going to benefit you. Okay. So what is a commission split with a brokerage? Mm. Yeah, it's it all varies. You know, but I think people should realize that this is as much a negotiation uh as they do with an interview with a client and who's trying to say, what are you charging me? I think, you know, agents need to come in and talk to the brokers, not only about those benefits and things that they're going to get out of it, but what they're going to have as far as their pay structure. Um, If it's a 10 or 20% off of each listing, if it's 50%, if it's more, then that's something that I least the agent needs to understand. So if, let's just use 50-50 as an example. So the broker says, hey, you're a new agent. I've got a lot of training that I'm going to give to you. Um, I'm going to help you through this process. So we're going to have a 50-50 split. Every deal that you do, I get 50% and you get the balance of the 50%. As the agent, then your next question should be, so what are you paying through the course of that? Because yeah. if I have advertising costs, are you splitting the cost with me? Or is all the cost coming out of my 50%? That's an important question. Um, and I can tell you, not one agent in 23 years has ever asked me that. Okay? So understanding that you need to negotiate for yourself and understand what the practices are, but everything is negotiable. Okay. So... If, so even though there's two agents in one brokerage, they might have different contracts. More than with likely, they have very different contracts. Okay. And a lot of brokerage, you know, from old school, a lot of brokerages, if you have so many years in the business, then you rate here, and if you have your uh, additional designations and licensing that you've done, then you're going to get this and you know, or we're going to compensate you by adding you into our relocation department or we're whatever. There may be additional benefits depending on that situation that the person feels that they're getting out of it, both as the broker and as the agent. Okay. What is like industry standard? Uh, I will say I don't think there's an industry standard. Um, I think 50-50 is pretty common as far as newbies, you know, coming in. Um, I have heard a lot of 60-40. There's 70-30. When I started in the business way back, (laughs) way back when, um, you know, I was very, very lucky in the respect that even as a new agent coming into it, the uh, broker saw a lot of the skills that I brought to the table, and um, I was on a 70-30 split. Um, and what she did, which I loved the idea was that she did a tier and that, Hey, if you have a really great month and you have a second transaction, then I'm going to move you to 75, 25. If you have a third transaction, you're going to be 80, 20. I'm going to tell you there were months I was hustling. I was trying to get all those closings to come in and invariably you get down to that stupid dang closing date and something goes wrong and it's like, Oh my gosh, I just lost money. Because now it falls into a new month. Yeah. And that was so heartbreaking. I remember how heartbreaking that was. And it's like, dang, you know, you don't think 5% is a big difference, but it can be a big difference on some of these. Um, So I think, you know, the brokerages have the flexibility to do whatever. Of course, if they're within um, like a franchise, they may be restricted on what they can do. But I'm an independent brokerage. I get to make the the agreements with the people based on what we have going on based on the market. Um, But I think the bigger conversation is, you know, you as the realtor, when you're having that conversation with a client, well, they want to know, well, if I'm, if you're charging me 10%, we're just going to use a random number. If you charge me 10%, that's a lot of money you're taking away. And you're looking at them and you're like, but I'm only getting 50% of that. Yeah. And on top of that, I'm paying for your advertising cost out front. So I'm not even going to get, I'm going to get reimbursed that money, but that's money out of my pocket. Yeah. So I really am not making that much. I think the 
idea of perspective is really important for consumers, for agents, for brokers. And when all of those things can come together, then you have a, a process that can work. You know, because you understand what's expected of you and you know what you're going to benefit. Okay, so how long is a realtor in training? And I say that like kind of mm. broad. Yeah, I think that's going to come off of an everybody is different. You know, there are brokerages that first day you walk in, you're on your own, do it. And you make a mistake, we'll figure it out at that point. But, you know, you're not really going to get anything. And then there are others. Um, I tend to want to make sure I've got confidence in what the agent is doing. So typically what I would do on a brand new agent coming in, they're going to shadow me for a while in the office and out in the field with clients. They're going to get to see how I interact, what words and terminology, paperwork, all of those details. They're just along for the ride. Um, one of my agents finally yelled out, oh, my God, don't you ever stop to eat? <laughs> like, no, I really don't, but okay, we can stop and eat. So <laughs> if I get on a roll, I'm on a roll. Um, but I think then once they get and they understand where they've seen a listing side and a buyer's side, and maybe I split those up and let's only deal with listings and we only deal with buying side because they may choose one or the other. Um, once I feel like they've got enough of a footing there and they start having contacts, contact them. Now they're going to be doing appointments. I'm going to go on those appointments with them because I just want to be there as a, as a watch over, make sure you got everything covered. And if I need to, I can come in and assist um, in a professional way, not to put them down or anything in front of a customer, mm -hmm. a client, but to make sure that they are covering the bases that need to be covered, you know, because we have requirements for paperwork prior to actions that we have to do. And so learning that once I see that they're able to articulate to a client, they're able to get through the paperwork, they're able to explain the questions and answer the things that they need to, um, then, hey, if you need me, I'm here. But if you're comfortable and you feel like you've got a good footing for this, then you're probably ready to fly. Fly. Yeah. <laughs> so ha when you have that contract with a brokerage, how long is that? typically? Um, most of the time it's renewed every year. Okay. Um, again, I didn't know if you did like a three month trial period. <laughs> and there have been times where that is absolutely what you would want to do. You would want to say, I want to have a trial period and make sure this is going to go. Um, it could be that it can be terminated by either party within 30 days or with a 30 day notice. Um, <clears throat> but I also will say, if there is something that's egregiously done, you don't want that person for 30 days even. You want out, done. Yeah. I'm sending your license back to state, and you need to get out of the business if that would be my recommendation. Um, so as a broker and as an agent, you want to make sure that you have all of those potential um, issues or scenarios covered in the language of your contract, okay. which is pretty straightforward. You can write the specific language on there. Um, notice to terminate within 24 to 48 hours. Um, the big thing that people need to know is that when you take a listing, you're an agent new to the business, any listings that you take belong to the brokerage. So say we have a falling out and you're not happy there, well, you don't get to take your listings with you. They oh. stay with the brokerage. So if you've gone under contract with something, it's still going to close out through my brokerage. Um, or through that brokerage. But then would the agent still get paid? So that's going to, again, depend on the language of that contract that they've signed. So um, it could be 100%, yep, you still get what you brought in. It could be, nope, you don't get anything because you left. And it could be everything in between. So the language of that agreement between broker and salesperson is very important. And I say salesperson because that's what it says on the agreement. Okay. which I think is weird, but yeah. um, between the broker and that agent, it is fully determined based off of the paperwork that they have. Oh, that's so, And that can vary. Again, yeah. so one person may have completely different reasonings and terms versus another. So are non-competes a thing in real estate? You know, I've heard of companies who say they've got this non-compete out there, but my understanding and my experience has always been in real estate, you really can't have a non-compete. First of all, I'm licensed in the state of Ohio. 
So if I signed up at brokerage ABC and I didn't like the way that was going and I terminate, then I need to be able to go to CDE. Yeah. And for ABC to say, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's within a five-mile range or that's in the same MLS or that's in this zip code or whatever they want to say that they have a non-compete, it would be very easy to maybe have to take it to court but to battle that because real estate is a different industry type that it's not a non-compete. Non-competes come in when you have proprietary information or you have specialized services and products that you're coming in here and I'm giving you the inside scoop on all of this stuff. Yeah. It doesn't work like that with real estate. I mean, I may show you what systems I use, but that doesn't mean you're required to. Or I may show you how the process is better done like this, but that doesn't mean you have to follow it. And bigger is that you are not an employee. Right. You're an independent contractor. As an independent contractor, you're carrying all the burden for your licensing, all the burden for your cost of running your business. And what am I contributing to it? I'm just basically the house that gets the money that then disperses it because of that contract that we have. Um, so I think non-competes have been very easy for people to not have as an issue for as a realtor. Okay, so I have seen, like, if they work for ABC Brokerage, but they're this group, what does that mean? Um, so our Ohio licensing law expanded to accept the idea of team concept. So as a team, hey, Ellie, you know a lot of people and you're really good and you also are really good at training other people. So you would be a great team lead if you wanted to be Ellie's top team and you want people to be on your team, they're going to work with you, but you're still under this brokerage. So your brokerage is still the overriding umbrella and then you're the team so they may work within you. You may have a different arrangement for them as to what duties they're going to do or what kind of compensation they're going to get. So are those realtors still? Could be. Could okay. Be. They could be licensed. They could be unlicensed assistants. But you could build your team to do those functions that you want to be able to do in business. Basically, um, you're a business within a business. So if it's an unlicensed assistant, is that uh, like an hourly thing or is that up to you. per job or up to you how oh, you okay. want to handle so you really it. have like contracts with those people as well you would be wise to have contracts with those people yes gotcha how many realtors work on a team versus work by themselves just straight for the brokerage um <clears throat> if you had to guess i'm gonna say 90 probably 90 to 95 percent realtors are on their own um i think it's a smaller number I, although in our area, there's a number of people who are called teams um, and, you know, they, so maybe that number is more like a 85%. Okay. So but it's a relatively new concept. It, it's a newer yeah. concept and it's new to the state allowing it. The advertising requirements for a team aspect is different than you, you have to clearly identify that as a team your name within the name of the brokerage. So the brokerage still has to be advertised, but your name is there. If it's Tammy Murphy on ABC team under RH2L, you can see real quick how that's a lot of information to put on a sign. Mm -hmm. People are driving fast. They're maybe only going to catch one part of that, but at least it's there and it's required to be there. So if you are a low man on the team mm -hmm. could and you close a listing, could potentially you owe your team a part of the percentage more than likely or more yes. than likely you owe yeah. your team part and then you owe your brokerage too so that 50 50 split now you're only getting 30 percent could be and what I would even go a step further is that the reason why I have I personally have never chosen to be a team concept is that I didn't like the idea of one person will probably be doing all the heavy lifting and another person's getting the easy side of things to do but we're going to split this. Right. Um, or worse is that, hey, I work under this person. I'm a part of a team, but they get all the credit. So we do, you know, accolades and things like that. Awards every year come out as to top producers in the area. And we had to create a team category versus the individual. 
um, and I just I have a husband and wife team that just joined me and they were expressing that they missed out on these sales awards this last time because the calculation for a team is different than the calculation for an individual. Oh, so if okay. Nicole had, as an example, if Nicole had put everything under her as she's a realtor, she'd exceeded and she'd have been on the awards list. But because it's her and her hubby, they only get a fraction of the t points that go into this calculation and therefore they missed mm -hmm. it. So if I was doing all the work and I'm turning it in, I as the individual agent on this team don't get to count any of my production, but the team lead is gonna take all of the credit. Gotcha. That is either a good thing or a bad thing or can turn from one to the other within those team aspects. So say you're not on a team but you go on vacation. Yep. Is it common practice you have a friend in your brokerage that kind of covers for you if you're on a cruise, let's say you don't have cell phone access? Um, I would say that yes, certainly first and foremost, you, have your, you should have your broker to be able to back you up. Okay. Because they're already in this dynamics, right? Um, but if that's not the case, then potentially you have a friend, an agent in the same office and in some cases, you may have an agent friend who's in a different office, but there's just an understanding of cooperation and not agency. They aren't taking over agency with the client. There's not representation, but this is all things that you have to have paperwork on if you do it. Gotcha. So a new realtor licensed gets with a brokerage, does the training. When, how long does it usually take to see your first paycheck? Uh, that's that, going back to that first contract. If you got lucky right off of the bat, you're 30 to 45 days to get paid. What average do you see people not normally for like three months, six months? Three to six months. Okay. And then what does the average realtor make per year? Well, so let's do this. So if your first deal comes in three to six months, um, <laughs> I'm going to say that as part of your business plan, you need to either factor what other source of income that you have or earning potential um, or side gig, whatever you're going to do in order to be able to make it because it could be three to six months for the first one. Well, is it going to be another three to six months for the second? Or are you going to get momentum where you have multiple deals that are going on? Potentially, you are months between checks. Okay. okay, months between deals, contracts, or closings. And so you need something that's going to tide you over or you need to just get out there and grind and make it happen and get multiples and then be good about saving money and putting money back and living on a budget. I'm big on ta talking about these things because if, a, if somebody wants to come into the business, I want it to be worthwhile for them yeah. and I want it to be long-term. Otherwise, don't waste the energy because you're taking away a deal from somebody who's already in it. Yeah. Right? So if that doesn't happen, then stay out. But mm -hmm. if you're in it for the long haul and you understand all of these things, I want to make sure you understand what all you need to be building yourself up to. Um, if you were busy and you were doing it and you've been in the business and you had one closing a, a month, every month throughout the year, that would be in our, potentially in our top agents. Okay. Oh. So... The number of agents who had zero transactions last year, 60%. Wow. It's a high number. And were these agents actively working though, or it's their They have gig? a license. Okay. So you're paying the fees, you're doing the stuff. Yeah. Why aren't you getting a deal? Like, why do you not have a single deal in one year? That at, would be concerning. At that point, wouldn't the brokerage be like, Let's look at this. Well, again, so depending on the brokerage, right, mm -hmm. and what their mentality is, um, brokerages of past would probably say, the more agents I get in here, the more I get to collect off of office fees or whatever. And if they get a deal, the more money I collect. So I'll take all the agents I can. Whereas somebody else is going to say, mm, I only want the agents who are going to do at this level. And I'm going to, you know, don't talk to me if you're not there. We, we, we are not going to work together well. 
Um, I think if you put yourself in either of those situations, you're probably, one, not doing the justice to the people that you could encourage to do better, Mm -hmm. but more importantly, you're doing a disservice to the industry. So I think it takes a mix. I think that you have to be willing to take on agents in those capacities and encourage them to grow their business and do those things and also hold them accountable if they they come in and they've got these grand ideas and I want to make $100,000 a year. Is it possible in real estate? Yes. Are you likely to do that your first year? No. When National Association of Realtors gives out information, the average national realtor earnings for their first year is $48,000. Okay. Very little. Um, as a professional who's gone through all this extra training, who have all these designations, I'm a part of Women's Council of Realtors. Um, our numbers, 86000 as an average. Oh. So if you take... So like double. If you take the million two agents out there and we have 300,000 across the country that are women's council, of those 300,000, we as an average earn 86,000 versus as an average of the agents across the country earn 48. So we're at a higher standard. Now you start leveling on your different designations and you're probably upping your averages. But as an average first time realtor coming in, if you could make 48000 that's 4000 a month. Um, now, that's not taxed because you got to pay your own taxes. So set that money aside. Make sure you do that. That's part of your business. Yeah. But is that something that you could live with? Um, and the reality is if it's going to take you six months to even start getting there, then you're probably not at 48. You're probably really maybe at 30 if you say if the timeline is going to work that way. Okay. So kind of moving away from money. Um, you are going out to try to get your first client. Why, as a seller or a buyer, do I use a new agent versus you who've been in and has all this experience? Um, Again, that's going to come down to you as the new agent and how you're able to communicate with the potential buyer or seller. Um, More than likely, it's somebody that you know because that's typical of what a new agent is going to do is reach out to everybody they know and say, hey, I got my real estate license. And everybody's going to be, great, you're the fourth one in the family to get it. Yeah. <laughs> everybody does that. Um, but you're going to reach out to the people that you know. And sometimes you're going to find out that people you know aren't going to use you. And that's a little bad, but maybe it's good in the other way because then you find out they were really difficult to work with anyway, and so you right. didn't want the headache. Family's usually the worst clients. There you go. <laughs> So, but it's good experience. And hey, if I really know that you're probably not going to sell your house, but can I go through my listing presentation with you? Use your friends and family, at least for that type of experience, so that you gain that. Once you're confident, once you know, again, the value of what you're going to do, how hard you're going to work for somebody, are you able to communicate that with a potential client? They're going to, that's either going to work for them or they're going to be like, well, how many years have you been in the business? And you're going to be like, well, I just got licensed. But you could fall back on the experience of your realtor, broker, your office as a whole and say, our office has been here for over 10 years. We're community driven. We have a broker who's been in the business for over 23 years. And we all work together to make sure our clients are being served. Boom. Now you have a upper hand versus if you didn't say, want to work off of everybody else's experience and use it to your benefit, then it's, uh, well, okay, this is your first one. Maybe it's not going to work out. Right. So um, what is like the burnout rate or dropout rate Mm. for a realtor? Because I've always heard, you know, it's like 99% or something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go back to that test, the thing that starts a lot. Um. I am amazed at the number of times I'm told by somebody that they have taken the test multiple times. The highest number I had somebody tell me that they've taken the test was 13 times. And I, I honestly looked at the person and I'm like, um, and you have still decided that this is the business you want to get into? Yeah. Like, I would take that as a sign. I am not supposed to do that. Like, right. something is hanging up. And you I have don't to pay money it. every time. Right? Yes, you do. 
So why in the world would you do that? Um, but a couple of times, you know, that's first time you're going to have a lot of nerves. You're not sure how it's going to work. You're not going gonna to get confused with the wording, all the stuff. Okay, maybe a couple of times. If it takes you more than that, again, maybe, excuse us. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we had a visitor. <laughs> We don't want that stink bug in there. He wanted to know how to be a realtor. <laughs> he, he, he was getting ready to crawl up on the mic, I think. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, yes, you do pay money each time that you take the test. But I think that I don't know where I was going. Where was I going? If you've taken it, like, multiple times, it's not for you. Not for you. But then, again, coming back to the comment that you made that, you know, being an intern or getting a feel for it, um, you know, I've had assistants who've worked, unlicensed assistants who've worked in the business with my brokerage, and they're great at marketing. And turn them loose on that, and that works well for them. Sometimes it is really finding out um, you have a better ability to communicate with a seller because you like the numbers of things um, versus, oh, you really like the the vibe, the decor of you know what trends are going on and so you're really into the buyer side of things there are multiple ways to be in the real estate industry that has opened up as a result of all of the technology that we've seen that I think as a brokerage that that's more important is to really hone in on what the particular person is wanting to be a part of and then make a good fit not everybody can do all of it so find the aspect that works well for you. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you like working with seniors or you like working with military members or you like working with first-time home buyers um, or you just like the behind the scenes, let me do podcasting and do all the marketing that needs to go on. Anymore, real estate has all of these fractions that are involved in their business and there's a place for you. Yeah. That's one of the things that I like about real estate that Lots kind of, of piques my interest is... It doesn't matter what you're good at. You can find your niche. Yes. Yeah. It's a good yeah. opportunity. Well, so if somebody is looking at getting licensed, right now would be a good time um, because then they would be at least under a broker by the spring, spring market, season. Yep. Which is when it's the most busy. Yes. And so I would say definitely, you know, I always do a lot of my continuing ed in the fall and winter season. That way, spring and summer. I don't have to worry about any of that because mm -hmm. we have certain hours that we have to do each year in order to turn in there. Um, so this way you know that you're getting done what you need to do, but you're able and poised for being able to be busy during that busy season. Um, but you can be busy throughout the year. And so I don't want people to think, oh, well, it's winter. Nobody buys a house in the winter. Guess what? If they're looking at houses and the snow is out there over your ankle, they're serious. The first house we bought with you was... Uh, <laughs> The week between Christmas and New Year's, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've And I actually have done a lot of business um, the week of Christmas. And, you know, it means that you adjust your family schedule. You do what you have to do. But if you, and as particular, uh, investors like to buy at the end of the year. The uh, money they need to spend before the end of the year, and they want to get those deals. And they'll go out there. If the house has been on the market now, it's hitting its third month, and it's the dead of winter. Sellers start getting a little bit more anxious they start taking better offers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's possible. Especially with interest rates and the whole variables that are in our All current reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But at least you have a really good, because of your experience in buying and selling over the different types of markets, you have a really great background. So, hmm, let me make a plug for you. <laughs> if you ever decide to get your real estate license, you know, I think you know a realtor who can be your broker. Yeah. Um, and it's just really, again, you know, you sometimes you find that people are really tuned into it. And I've had a lot of clients that we get to know each other through the process and you find out, hey, you know, you'd be really good at this. And if that ever comes up, you let me know. Um, just simply because, that relationship would then go into a new direction and understanding of I would definitely be there to make sure that you're supported and that you grow your business the way that you need to. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, you know, when we've talked about this, uh, I think that that out of all of the pieces of this puzzle, your relationship with your broker is kind of the most important. It is. 
And it's probably the one that's least thought of by most people yeah. on both sides. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Awesome. So if you are interested in being a realtor and have other questions, feel free to comment below. Uh, it is specific to states, so I can answer generically. I can answer specific to what I am experienced with with my own brokerage. Every broker is different, just like every agent is different, and all of the different things we talked about is all negotiable. Yeah. Oh, and we haven't done a tip. Ah, well, the tip is make sure you ask all those questions. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you get answers before you sign anything. Make sure you understand what it is that you're committing to and what does it cost you and are you going to get the support that you need and what happens when you need to go on vacation. Yeah. Those are the things. Yep. All right. Thanks for joining us today on the Real Tea Podcast. If you enjoyed the knowledge and entertainment today, please subscribe and share with your friends. We will be embarking on a journey that bridges the gap between realtors and clients, uncovering the heart and tea of real estate.